I put a spell on you. And now you're mine. I put a spell on you. And now you're mine. I put a spell on you. Witchcraft and popular culture. Witches are stereotyped as wicked old women with wrinkled skin and pointy hats, black outfits, pointed grotesque nose, and black cats. They are often shoaled with cauldrons, potions, broomsticks, and again, the stereotyped black cat. However, witchcraft can be defined as the influence on another's mind, body, or property against his or her will. Witches have been persecuted because of misconceptions about them and their practices, including the stereotypes mentioned above. The practice of witchcraft is not necessarily associated with evil nor the worshipping of the devil, which is widely believed. What do you think of when I say the word witch? The stereotypical black pointy hat? Well, that would make me a witch, wouldn't it? The witch evil sorceress, seductive enchantress flying in the moonlight. What do we know of her mysterious origins? Who were the real women behind the myth of the witch? It is said that witchcraft originated alongside human civilization itself. Witches have been around as long as the human community has been trying to deal with disease and avert disaster. It may be that they developed from early goddess cults, um, that these are the women who serve the goddess. Prehistoric art depicts magical rites to ensure successful hunting. People who depended on the earth for sustenance, on the cycles of nature, on uh, the reproductive capacities of the earth to survive, and the association of those natural forces with the female body, and therefore the identification of the female as sacred, makes perfect sense. Not only did the ancients worship powerful female deities, but throughout the Middle East, Often those who practiced the holiest of rituals were women. Could these priestesses, trained in the sacred arts, have been the earliest antecedents of the witch? Even in Hebrew culture, the character Lilith, which translates to night hag or night monster, was a child-killing witch. Witches even appear in the Bible. In the story of King Saul consulting the so-called Witch of Endor. In fact, there are a lot of similarities between paganism, witchcraft, and Christianity. Early Christianity developed in an era of the Roman Empire, during which many religions were practiced. These religions, due to the lack of a better term, are called paganism. Paganism is commonly used to refer to various, largely unconnected religions from the time period, such as the Greco-Roman religions of the Roman Empire. During the Christianization of Europe, the Christian churches adopted many elements of these national cult and folk religions. For example, Easter was named after the Norse goddess Ostara, who was associated with a rabbit and ate eggs to stay immortal. The modern tradition of decorating homes with trees during Christmas time came from candy canes and holly that were used to decorate pagan temples back in the times of ancient Greece. Even the Greek god Bacchus's birthday was on December 25th, just as Jesus's, and they were both crucified for the benefit of mankind and both rose again on the third day. All of this was done very cleverly and consciously in an effort to ease the transition to Christianity. 
By linking these Christian imageries with already present pagan imagery, the Christian church found a foothold in the empire. A book of black magic and spells is even attributed to Honorius, a pope during the 13th century. The book, called the Grimoire of Pope Honorius III, includes spells to be used specifically by priests during Mass. It even calls for the human sacrifice of a virgin child. Western beliefs about witchcraft grew out of mythologies and folklore of ancient peoples, especially the Greeks and the Romans. Circe, the witch from Greek mythology, enchanted sailors with her brew of honey wine, and then she was able to turn men into pigs. It wasn't until the early Renaissance period that our modern perception of a witch was truly formed. In this etching by German painter and printmaker Albrecht Dürer, you can see this naked crone sitting on top of a horned goat, which is obviously a symbol of the devil. She's even holding a broomstick. This print was produced during the golden age of witchcraft imagery, the tumultuous 16th and 17th centuries, when vicious witch trials convulsed Europe. The peak of the witch hunts lasted from 1550 to 1630. The Malleus Maleficarum is a treatise on the prosecution of witches, written in 1486 by Heinrich Kramer, a German Catholic clergyman. It's basically the first witch hunt manual. The Malleus Maleficarum warned the torturer never to look a witch in the eye for fear of her evil powers. As a result, there was an outpouring of brutally misogynistic witchcraft imagery. There were towns in Germany in particular where there were no women left after the inquisitors came through. However, some of the most well-known witch trials were here in America. The Salem Witch Trials are an infamous series of trials and prosecutions of people accused of witchcraft in colonial Massachusetts. The trials went on between February of 1692 and May of 1693. The debacle started when a group of young girls claimed to be possessed by the devil. In turn, doctors and ministers watched in horror as the girls contorted themselves, cowered under chairs, and shouted nonsense. Lacking any natural explanation, the Puritans turned to the supernatural. The girls must be bewitched by the devil. The trials are noted as America's most notorious case of mass hysteria. People would accuse their friends, neighbors, and even their family members of witchcraft. Naming witches became a crusade, not only for Salem, but for all of Massachusetts. When the governor of Massachusetts' own wife was accused, he suspended the special court assigned to naming these witches and replaced it with a more strict court that called for true evidence for a witch to be proven guilty. Months later, he pardoned all those who were imprisoned on witchcraft charges. The trials resulted in an execution, mostly by hanging, of 20 people, 14 of those women. In efforts to scientifically explain the executions, a study in 1970 cited a fungus, which is found in rye, wheat, and other cereals, which can cause symptoms of delusions, vomiting, and muscle spasms. Witchcraft practices were present in America before Salem. A common thread throughout all Native American culture is their sense of awareness and oneness with their land, plants, and creatures of that land. They believed in the power of nature and strived to maintain a sense of unity with her unforeseen forces. Each region of Native America had its unique kind of witchcraft, which used different kinds of amulets and charms. They had their own rituals and masks. The practitioners of witchcraft wore costumes specific to the region. They had their own carvings, totem poles, and performed ceremonies according to the areas where they lived. In spite of all these regional differences, they all shared a sense of awareness and oneness with their land, plants, and creatures of Native America.
The witches and medicine men used several methods and tools to diagnose the ailments of the patients, such as crystal rocks and using their trembling hands in a state of trance. Sometimes they chanted sacred hymns while diagnosing the diseases. The shamans, usually women, served the community by performing ceremonies to cure several diseases and ward off evil influences over the weather and the harvest. Herbs used to be an important medium of curing the sick persons. Modern day witchcraft in America is not very different from previous day practices. They identify themselves through different branches including pagans, neo-pagans, and the most common practice, Wicca. Wiccans in America today follow the old religion where they worship the great mother goddess and her male counterpart, the horn god. They wish to practice their religion in peace and avoid any discrimination for following what they believe in much like other religions practice today. The term witch or wicca does not only apply to females but to males as well, demolishing the stereotype that all witches are women. While many believe witchcraft is unnatural and is using the powers of the devil, it is said that the witch's powers come from already present psychic abilities that exist in everyone. They have been able to tune into them and develop their abilities to form what we consider magic. Wiccan worship occurs in a small group known as a coven, which may consist of anywhere from 3 to around 20 members, and according to the faces of the moon. These monthly meetings for worship are referred to as esbats. Worship also occurs in larger groups. Several hundred people coming from long distances may meet, as when two covens converge for Sabbaths, of which there are eight each year. The eight Sabbaths of the year are Samhain, Yule, Imbolic, Ostara, Beltane, Summer Solstice, Lugnasad, and Mabin. A lot of natural elements are used in the practice of witchcraft by crystals which tune into the healing powers of the earth. At this point in time, we're going to pass around three stones that we bought at an occult bookstore. The white stone that you will see being passed around is called clear quartz and it is known as the master healer. It will amplify energy and thought as well as the effect of other crystals. It absorbs, stores, releases, and regulates energy. It balances and revitalizes the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual planes. It cleanses and enhances the organs and subtle bodies and acts as a deep soul cleanser, connecting the physical dimension with the mind. Clear quartz also enhances psychic abilities. It aids in concentration and unlocks memory. It stimulates the immune system and brings the body in balance. The purple stone that you'll see being passed around is called amethyst. Amethyst is a meditative and calming stone which works in the emotional, spiritual, and physical planes to provide calm, balance, patience, and peace. Amethyst is used as beneficial when dealing with legal problems and money issues which can lead to prosperity and abundance although it is not the best known prosperity stone. In the psychic and spiritual realms, Amethyst is an excellent all-purpose stone that can increase spirituality and enhance intuition and psychic powers of all kinds. It does this by making a clear connection between the earth plane and the other planes and worlds. Amethyst is also excellent for meditation and lucid dreaming. It is used to open one's channels to telepathy, past life regression, clairaudience, clairvoyance, and communications with angels. Amethyst also protects against psychic attacks, especially during spiritual work. The third stone that we're passing around is Goldstone, also known as the Stone of Ambition. Goldstone is said to help attain one's goals. It is also said to help one stay calm and stabilize emotions. It can be used as an energy generator and can deflect unwanted energies making it also used as a protection stone. Goldstone also has many of the metaphysical properties of copper, including in crystal healing lore, the strengthening of the circulatory system, strengthening bones, and easing arthritis pain. Goldstone is actually a man-made glass with flecks of copper suspended in it, which give it the sparkles. It was said to have originally been created by French monks, 
and in time the secret was lost. It's been rediscovered or recreated in modern times though, and goldstone is a popular material because of the beauty as well as its metaphysical properties lore. Goldstone comes in the original brown, a blue purple, and a green. Each color brings its energies into the goldstone as well. Please note that healing crystal meanings are spiritual supports to healing and are not prescriptions or healthcare information. Gemstones are valued by witches for their healing properties and their ability to hold and channel energies. And metals also have inherent properties and associations. So witches use these materials consciously. Knowing their properties, we can know that when witches wear gold, we are calling on something different than when we wear silver. When we place a crystal on the altar, we know it is doing something other than a pearl would do. This awareness is fundamental to the living practice of Wicca. I mean, I think the fundamental thing about the magical religions and about pagan religions is that ultimately, they say, within yourself, you are the god, you are the goddess, and therefore, what is so subversive in a very powerfully beautiful way about the pagan religions is that for women, they say, look, you too are God. Not all witchcraft is dark spells and evil forces. More typical of modern Wicca is Selena Fox. In America's Midwest, she embraces people with white magic. A lot of people really confuse witchcraft or Wicca, um, pagan religions with devil worship. They feel that it's evil, that we're harming people, um, that we're putting spells over people without, you know, consulting them. And we're really not coming from that space at all. However, not everywhere is as open to these witchcraft ideas as we are in America. There is widespread belief in witchcraft around the world. The belief itself isn't harmful, but the actions that some people take based on those beliefs may be really harmful to others. On February 15th of this year, this image went viral on the internet. It is of a two-year-old Nigerian boy who was left for dead by his family after they accused him of being a witch. In Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo, at the Gallicane Catholic Church, Father Alexis Kadziota Mungala has performed thousands of exorcisms on children, saying that he is releasing them from the devil. These youngsters are accused of killing relatives by eating their flesh and drinking their blood in the dead of night. They're accused of casting spells, delivering death, illness, unemployment, pregnancy, debt, or even simply bad luck to any and all around. But possibly the worst of all, they are accused of being evil, having the devil living within them. As Father Alexis says, witchcraft is part of our tradition. It is part of the Congolese culture. A new poll found that belief in magic is widespread throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, with over half of respondents saying that they personally believe in witchcraft. Studies in 18 countries show belief varies widely, ranging from 15% in Uganda to 95% in the Ivory Coast, but on average 55% of people polled believe in witchcraft. However, these practices of hunting down and even killing those accused of witchcraft are not limited to Africa. In India, between 2001 and 2006, police have reports of over 700 women being killed as witches or witch doctors in eastern India alone. The Dakini Vidya form of witchcraft is widely practiced by women in India. Similar to Wicca, it involves invoking the mother goddess to draw spiritual strength. 
Unfortunately, perhaps because of lack of education and literacy, witches are often persecuted by villagers who blame them for natural disasters, illness, death, or theft. <laughs> और बांस लगा कर बम्बू लगा कर के खान में उठा करके ले गया है नदी के पार में लेके ऐसा कर एंड लकली देयर आर पीपल फाइटिंग दीस अट्रोशियस विच हंट्स एंड वी आर लकी टू लिव इन अ पार्ट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड वेयर बिलीविंग इन विका और विच क्राफ्ट वोंट कॉस्ट यू योर लाइफ In the Americas, especially in Central and Latin America and the Caribbean, witchcraft is still believed in. While voodoo originated in West Africa, it came from the African diaspora around 1510 and is most common in Cuba, Brazil, and Haiti. Upon the arrival in the West Indies and the New World, African slaves found themselves unable to continue the practice of their ancestral rites, sometimes under the penalty of death. But they quickly understood the essential similarities between their beliefs and those of the Catholics. The Catholics praying to their saints to intercede to a higher god in their favor. The elaborate ceremonies and costumes of the church also had great appeal for the Africans. In the Spanish islands, A new religion became known as Santeria, which is called the worship of the saints. In other islands and in New Orleans, the term voodoo remained. Because of its unique blend of French, Spanish, and Indian cultures, New Orleans offered a perfect setting for the practice and growth of voodoo. Exotic, barbaric, the cult of voodoo. Brought to Haiti from Africa centuries ago by Negro slaves, the cult of voodoo embodies the worship and fear of devil gods. As with other forms of witchcraft around the world, voodoo is no exception to all of the misconceptions that surround these interesting religions. To the Africans, voodoo was not only their religion, it was also their natural medicine, their protection, and certainly a way of asserting and safeguarding a sense of personal freedom and identity. Today, about 15% of the population of New Orleans practices voodoo. Modern voodoo has taken several directions. Spiritualist reverends and mothers who have their own churches Hoodoos, who integrate and work spells and superstitions, elements of European witchcraft and the occult, and traditionalists, for whom the practice of voodoo is a most natural and important part of their daily lives. The practice of voodoo involves the search for higher levels of consciousness in the belief that, as indeed all of the ancient scriptures teach, it is we who must open the way towards the gods. For when we call out from our hearts, the gods hear and indeed are compelled to respond. And now we've come full circle back to Chicago, where our group decided to take a field trip over to the occult bookstore, Alchemy Arts in Edgewater. While we were walking around, we had the opportunity to interview an employee, Amanda, and we asked her how she got into the Wicca culture and specifically how she started working at the store. Well, culture is the sort of thing that you find out you're a part of it once you realize other people are doing it. But uh, when it comes to being at the store, I've been here longer than I truly care to admit. I started out as a customer. Um, oh, very cool. Yeah, a couple of years ago, uh, I just came in, thought it was the best place like this that I had seen because of the racks of herbs over there. I do a lot of herb magic, so I saw this plethora of things that I'd never seen anywhere else. And um, about a year later, started booking them for a job, and I haven't been able to get rid of them since. We also asked Amanda if she was a practicing Wiccan. Um, Wicca is absolutely a religion with 
the god and goddess, the devotionals that you should do. You should do a multitude of holidays. I do the major holidays, but I'm not so much on prayer. So let's say Wiccan light. We asked Amanda if there are any commandments that Wiccans follow. And she said that although it's much debated, there are a few more important ones. I mean, some say there's a litany as long as 37, some say, oh, there's 13 rolls, but really, there's one. And ye harm none, do as thou wilt. Do what you want, but don't be an asshole. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. Basically the golden rule. And also, whatever you do will return to you times three. So do what you want, but it'll all come back on you. Amplified, though, so it's not just an even exchange, it's worse. You do a good thing, three good things happen to you. You do a bad thing, Either three bad things or something three times as bad happens to you. So if you don't want to get it back, don't put it out there. As we've learned over the last 25 minutes, whether it's across cultures or across time, from early goddesses to modern witches in Hollywood movies, there's still a hugely prevalent belief in witchcraft around the world. Most traditions have common threads that reach thousands of years back. It's still hugely misunderstood in our own time, with sometimes deadly consequences. But in some places, like here in Chicago, witches are free to practice their religion. Witchcraft is imbued with a faith in divine powers, with a profound respect in Mother Nature and love of humanity.